I'm going to try to put the lie to the claim that no real climate scientists publish evidence that doesn't agree with the idea that global warming is going to be a serious problem. Now, being ex-NASA, I'm in favor of a mission to planet Earth and the satellites we've put up there. That's actually where uh, most of the billions of dollars win. The first main uh, Earth observation satellite in this age of mission to planet Earth was the NASA Terra satellite. Now, notice that it's only been providing data since about early 2000. So to study the bumps on the line, that natural climate variability, all those uh, jaggedy things there, uh, we don't have that much data yet. Uh, but we can still learn some interesting things. Uh, the satellite I'm involved with, um, with the uh, Advanced Microwave Scanning Radiometer, that's on the NASA Aqua satellite. We have even less data from that in instrument. Now, to me the big question, when you ask how much global warming are we going to see from extra CO2, is how sensitive is the climate system? Climate sensitivity goes as one over the feedbacks. So if you know the feedbacks, you know the climate sensitivity, and I'll probably use them kind of interchangeably. If all you did was just double the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere, you're only going to get about one degree C of warming, which, yawn, isn't, isn't that much to be worried about. That's how will clouds change? from that little bit of warming. Will they change in such a way to amplify it or to actually cut back on it? Now the real concern amongst climate modelers is positive feedbacks. All of the IPCC, over 20 you know, main models that the IPCC looks at, all are dominated by positive feedbacks. Uh, and if the feedbacks are too positive, you start talking about tipping points, runaway greenhouse effect, you know, melting ice sheets, all of that stuff, okay? But I'm here to talk about two other things. The two main cloud feedbacks. Now, you probably already got the impression that climate is all about incoming sunlight. That's this SWC. SW means short wave, or just think of sunlight. And then LW is long wave or infrared. These are the two radiative flows. You know, the sun, short wave comes in, uh, the long wave goes out and cools the earth. And, uh, and clouds affect both of them. You know, clouds reflect solar and they emit long or trap long wave. There's a, I mean, the <coughs> clouds are the second biggest greenhouse, natural greenhouse component of the atmosphere after water vapor. All right, and then the negative lapse rate feedback, everybody assumes that's negative, um, it, but it's not that big, and I'm not gonna spend any time on it. First publication I'm gonna talk about was published in Geophysical Research Letters last August. We took four instruments from three different satellites and studied a composite of these 15 Intraseasonal oscillations. This is uh, AMSU measurements of tropospheric temperature for one year. See those big spikes there? That's a year's worth of data showing several big intraseasonal oscillations in tropospheric temperature. Now, what, what I did was we took 15 of the strongest ones over six years that we have NASA's uh, Terra satellite data. We only have you know six or seven years to work with now. Composited 15 of these guys together. We go right down the center of those graphs. That represents the day of maximum tropical temperatures. And then it goes 30 days before that to the left, 30 days after that to the right. So we're compositing about the warmest uh, tropical temperatures. And uh, the top one, the red line, actually shows that tropical temperature. It's the red line that looks like a pyramid. And I've got some other stuff there, water vapor and wind speed and how those things change as this composite interseasonal oscillation evolves through its lifetime. Now that second one with the hump there, uh, those humps, that's above normal rainfall that we measure from satellite, which corresponds to the warming you see in that red pyramid in the first panel. And this, there's nothing new about this. This is totally expected. When the tropics heat up, it's because you have above normal rainfall activity. Rainfall represents heat that's been transferred from the surface when the water was evaporated until it's released when the clouds form. And that's what causes these big events in the, in the tropics to heat up or cool down. It's generally related to more rainfall activity or less rainfall activity. So there's nothing new there. More rainfall, that hump in the second panel causes the warming trend you see in the first panel. Okay. Now, here's where things get different. This is from uh, NASA's series instrument, which measures radiative fluxes. Solar uh, reflected, SW there is, is uh, solar reflected, and then LW is emitted long wave. Now, the solar shortwave, reflected solar shortwave, I don't know whether you can see it or not, but it's a hump that looks like the humps in the rain, uh, 
features above it. That's to be expected. You know, if you get more rainfall, you usually have more clouds, okay? But the long wave curve is what was unexpected, the infrared. See, all the climate models act such that if you produce more rainfall, you get more reflected short wave, which would be a negative feedback, but also you get more trapped long wave because it, these rain systems produce cirrus clouds, okay? Cirrus clouds that come out of the top of these rain systems, or even snow systems at high latitudes, those have a strong greenhouse effect, all right? A natural greenhouse effect. But what we found is shortly after the troposphere started to warm up, for a few days there were more cirrus clouds, and then from then on the cirrus clouds coming out of these rain systems dissipated. There was less and less and less cirrus clouds. The bottom plot, you see the blue uh, dash line where it says ice? Well, that's the coverage by cirrus clouds. And you see that shortly after the tropics start to heat up, you know that red line going up to the left of the red pyramid, uh, the ice cover starts going down. This is exactly opposite of the way all the climate models behave. Okay, this is a big deal. Well, it ends up, if you run the numbers, it's a very strong negative cloud feedback. Uh, 6.5 watts per square meter per degree Kelvin. That's the units we, we use. Um, and it's a, a pretty tight relationship you can see there. Now this was kind of unexpected. And I would challenge climate modelers to put this mechanism in their climate models, mimic nature, and then show me how much global warming you get in 100 years when you double the CO2. My conclusion is that if there is one organizing principle of temperature control on Earth, as far as the climate system goes, and its precipitation systems. I wouldn't have said this until about a year or so ago. I've had climate modelers tell me, how can precipitation systems be so important? I mean, they're off, you know, they, they cover a small percentage of the Earth at any given time. What they forget is that all of the air, even the air you are breathing right now within a matter of days to weeks, is going to be sucked up into a precipitation system, which is going to take out a certain amount of our main greenhouse gas, water vapor, and then dump the air out into the rest of the atmosphere. Even though evaporation is occurring nearly everywhere, all the time, all over the Earth, the atmosphere never fills up with water, does it? It nowhere gets near saturation. And there's only one reason why. Precipitation systems. They are the only way for it to come out again. Guess what we don't understand very well? What happens inside those clouds? 